about 13 at a church in George Street called Central Baptist 13. Church. 13. Yeah. That's We've known cool. each other for a long time. <laughs> so Karen, play school, effervescent, bubbly, always happy, <laughs> um, reality or fiction? Uh, it is reality, but it is part fiction too. Um, I mean, there is a part of me that is very much, you know, very childlike, loves to have fun, loves to make people smile and laugh and it's, uh, cares greatly for, you know, um, especially children's, you know, lives and welfare and wanting to give them joy. But there is another part of me that um, is definitely not that and um, ha is a little darker, a little more challenging. When I was 19, I was actually um, diagnosed with depression. And, um, and I didn't have much understanding of it. All I knew what I felt, I mean, at that time it was this sense of despair and there was this sadness, deep sadness. And we started to realise through counselling that it was issues from my childhood, my past, um, just from uh, just very uh, hurtful and very deeply um, tough experiences. Um, some of them being like abuse and stuff like that. So just constantly kept crying like non-stop and I uh, and you know and so I didn't know what it was and realized it was depression but because I got to I didn't really want to deal with it the issues the underlying issues I just kind of left it and just sort of had a bit of you know counseling and a bit of you know medication and I felt yeah I'm better just left it all behind band-aid band-aid went straight into NIDA you know studied the three years of acting I was like you know um, all fired up and I think it was in the middle there, like it started to come back and I just kept it under wraps, uh, you know. And then uh, I got into play school at the end of, you know, NIDA and it was a, it was, truly was a joyful job. It was like as if I could leave things behind and just live the, out there in front of the camera and, and entertain and have fun myself. But that underlying depression and all those issues were boiling. Like they were just, because they weren't, you know, they weren't looked at, they weren't resolved. and and they started to rise. And by the time I hit 28, it kind of, it triggered and it, you know, it, ex it just exploded. I wasn't sleeping. I didn't want to eat. Um, I was constantly, my, my thoughts just were tumbling over one over the other. So they had said to go to this doctor who was very good at, um, you know, mental health. And he said, look, it really sounds like you have um, bipolar. What exactly are you talking about when you use the term bipolar? First of all, I have what they call um, bipolar one, which is uh, it's more high, very high highs and very low lows. But they they don't happen all the time. It's like it's you know it happens and then a time might pass and then you know and then it kind of hits bipolar two, that, which is the other um, type of bipolar, is that it's a more constant up and down, up and down, and not as the depth and the height is not as great. And because there was a lack of understanding and a lack of, for myself, um, also a willingness. I went into my first episode um, as with bipolar and I cannot remember what happened. I only remember that first point, going to that doctor and that, all that weird stuff and then I got lost mm. um, and it flew. At the time was very frightening. Uh, the, the high that she was experiencing was yet, there was, it was about a week <clears throat> where she where she almost didn't sleep at all and it be, it, it started to show signs of danger because there was also another time when she um, actually said that she thought she could fly she could jump off our balcony and land on the ground safely below and we're not talking a couple of no meters, we're talking no like it, it would be it would be fatal so there was times where I'd have to take time off work I'd have to literally watch her every moment mm -hmm. of the day um, and it was it was too much and, and so when we you know, saw the doctor they basically said she, she needed to go into hospital she needed to be monitored for her own safety because that's how dangerous it was getting. The bipolar depression is like hits so hard so deep so dark and so lost you kind of it's like it really is like the like a high but the other extreme it's like you're taken to the other extreme because both in actual fact are lonely places there's so many times i could have lost my you know that i lost my life because i tried 
I didn't want to. I didn't want to live. And I, I, I remember, you know, so many times, you know, trying to, you know, lose my life, and so many times I could have lost it. But yet again, by you know the grace of God, it did not happen. Mm. But um, and that's the thing I think in the end is for people in mental health, whether it be bipolar or whether it be depression, number one thing is to reach out, whether to your family, to your friends, or to like, you know, those really important places that are happening is like, you know, Lifeline, you know, SANE, all those other ones, call them because they are really, really effective. What does it look like? What might people see in someone who is experiencing that very low depression or that very high mania? For the person that you know, you know what they look like, how they sound like, what they do when they're healthy and well. And you're looking for those signs that tell you those things become absent or they start to uh, display behaviours or, or they start to act in ways that are unusual. And I think definitely uh, if you've got a good um, support team, not only just family and friends, but particularly treating professionals, uh, not, not relying on your own objectivity. If there's signs of uh, self-harm, suicidal thoughts, never, never take those as, oh, it, it's, it's, just a, it's just words. How do you grow through the depression to survive those kind of experiences? It took a lot of like work, um, you know, with counselling and you know, went back to a lot of, you know, very troubled childhood, you know, experiences and having to work through those things and having to move through the pain. And that's the tough thing I think about mental illness is that you got to move through it, you know, and you got to um, move through the experience and um, understand, yeah, there is no, like I said, yeah, it comes some, from somewhere and there's always a source. There was a point when it used to be like I was, you know, I very much was like I have bipolar, I am identified as bipolar. Um, that now I know is not my identity. You that are Karen is, first. I am Karen first mm -hmm. and that is what I have but it is not what I am. Mental health is a part of, you know, it's, it's a part of life. Everyone has mental health. You know, everyone has their good days and their bad days. Everyone has to take care of their mental health, like, you know. No one's, mm. you know, not susceptible to, yep. yeah. So as you look forward to the future together, what are some of the bright things that you're looking forward to? Yeah, we really would like to have a family, but it hasn't been possible because of my sickness and because of the amount of medication that I've been on. And so I'm at this point where we, you know, slowly just kind of weaning off the, you know, the, the ones that are not needed anymore. And it's actually at a point where it's like, oh, it's kind of, the possibility is more hopeful than it has ever been to, you know, um, to have children. So that's, you know, a really great hope. I am in, being in the healthiest place I've been in for the, now for the last two years, you know, of my life. And, and it's just amazing just to feel that that's like, in that sense, it's a great, you know, um, a hope because that's just going to continue to grow, you know, like, um, and a sense of identity, you know, just of knowing solidly, you know, in terms of who I am, what I can do, um, what, I'm, what my potential is, you know, I am more here and present than I have ever been. And so in that sense, I, you know, I'm now I can finally go, wow, these, what can I dream, what can I hope and, you know, and know that I can actually get there. I'm glad that you have that hope. You sound <laughs> like you have had an amazing journey and a lot of growth over a long time. It's not an easy fix. And I just want to say thank you so much for opening up and sharing with us. And I know that as people listen to your journey, that they'll identify and that the elephant in the room has been identified and allowed to be free so that other people can talk about it. So thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Karen. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Our pleasure. <laughs>